Welcome to Simpler Bible, a daily journey to biblical understanding. Episode 57 today, I have called Covenant and Repentance. We're going to be in Deuteronomy 29 and 30. Without further ado, let's just dive right in. Deuteronomy 29 verse 1. These are the words of the covenant that the Lord commanded Moses to make with the people of Israel in the land of Moab, beside the covenant that he had made with them at Horeb. Remember, Moab is where they were with uh, Balaam in Numbers. And remember that even though Numbers has been a while ago, this is all occurring within about a five or six month span. Moses summoned all of Israel and said to them, You have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh, to all of his servants, to all of his land, the great trials that your eyes saw, the signs and those great wonders. But to this day, the Lord has not given you a heart to understand or eyes to see or ears to hear. I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes have not worn out on you. Your sandals have not worn off on your feet. You have not eaten bread and you have not drunk wine or strong drink that you may know that I am the Lord God. So there's that phrase again. Uh, but this is what we want to look at. We want to look at verse four. To this day, the Lord has given you a heart, has not given you a heart to understand, nor eyes to see, nor ears to hear. Now, this idea, uh, specifically the idea of the eyes to see and the ears to hear, is one that's repeated throughout the Old Testament as it relates to Israel. And what God is saying here through Moses is, all these things have taken place from ex from Egypt now in these 40 years. All these things have taken place, but God has kept you from seeing it. God's kept you from really getting it. And you kind of go, okay, why? What's going on here? Well, let me, let me point you to another text that we will cover eventually when we get to Isaiah, but it'll be good for us to introduce it now. So in Isaiah 6, uh, what we have is you have this, this prophet. He's a, he's a young prophet. He's at the beginning kind of of his ministry. And Isaiah 6, beginning in verse 1, says, In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord seated on the throne. The train of his robe filled the temple, and the whole place was filled with smoke, and the threshold of the temple shook. The train of the robe, the train of the Lord's robe filled the temple, and he was surrounded by seraphim, each with six wings. With two they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew, crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And I said, woe is me, for I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And an angel came, and he took from the altar a coal, and he touched it to Isaiah's lips, and he said, this has made you clean. And then the Lord said, who, who will I send? Who will go for me? And Isaiah says, here am I, send me. And he says, what shall I say, Lord? And the Lord says, go and say to this people, be ever seeing, ever seeing eyes, right? but never perceiving, ever hearing, but never understanding. And Isaiah says, for how long, Lord? And he says, until the city lies desolate. Now, be ever seeing, but never perceiving, ever hearing, but never understanding of, of, of the people of Israel. This is what God has said of them because they've been idolatrous, because they've been rebellious, because they've been stubborn hearted, because they've rejected his prophets, because they've rejected his counsel. Basically, the 40 years in the wilderness is a small kind of synopsis of everything else that's going to happen for the next hundreds of years in the Old Testament. This 40 years in the wilderness is a great picture for how Israel is going to behave. They're going to be stubborn hearted. They're going to reject the prophets. They're going to reject the word of the Lord. They're going to become idolatrous. They're going to turn away from God. And what's really interesting is this quote that's used in Isaiah 6 that we first see here in Deuteronomy, he says, may they be ever seeing but never perceiving, ever hearing but never understanding. It's quoted in the New Testament by Jesus. It's quoted in the New Testament by John, not just in the book of John, but by John himself as the author. It's quoted by Paul. And it's always in relation to Israel rejecting Christ, that Israel had to reject Christ. It's used in Matthew 13 when, when, and, and in John 12 and in Acts 28, these ideas that, in fact, in Acts 28, Paul has made it to Rome after two years of prison in Caesarea and after a very eventful boat trip to Rome. And he's in Rome and he's meeting with the Jews and he's preaching to them Christ and they disbelieve in the resurrection. And he says, rightly did Isaiah the prophet say of you that you would be ever hearing but never, uh, or ever seeing but never perceiving, ever hearing but never understanding. Now I'll go to the Gentiles. So like he's just ripping them to pieces. And these were the Jews who rejected God so that the gospel could be brought to the Gentiles. So when we see this here in Deuteronomy 4, it's foreshadowing Isaiah 6, which is foreshadowing the people in the days of Jesus who will reject Christ so that salvation will be brought to the world. And why, you might ask, is it necessary that Christ be rejected by the Jews? Well, that answer is found for us in 1 Corinthians 2.8. 
which says, if they had believed he was the Lord of glory, they would not have crucified him. So they were kept from seeing that Christ was the Lord of glory. They were kept from seeing the power of God. They were kept from seeing the majesty of God so that they would crucify Christ and so that salvation could be brought to the world. And so these Jews who are about to go into the promised land have still missed the power of God, but it was by design. And so uh, he says to them, keep the words of the covenant that you may prosper in your land that you, and in all that you do. You are standing today, all of you before the Lord your God, the heads of your tribes, your elders, your officers, the men of Israel. Look at verse 11. Your little ones, your wives, the stranger who is in your camp, from the one who chops your wood to the one who draws your water so that you may enter into the sworn covenant of the Lord your God with the Lord that he is making with you today, that he may establish you as his people and that he may be your God as he promised you and as he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There they are again. Remember all of this that God is doing is about his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It is not with you alone that I am making the sworn covenant, but with whoever is standing here with us today before the Lord our God and with whoever is not here with us today. So this is really cool. He says, I'm making this covenant with not just you who are here, the Hebrews, okay? But I am also making this covenant um, with whoever is standing here today. That's the strangers that came with them out of Egypt. That's that's a picture of, of these other people who are traveling with the Hebrews. And then whoever is not standing here with us today, and that's, that's a picture of kind of like these future people of faith, the people who are going to come out of this and put faith in the things of God and serve the things of God. Because remember, the promise that God made to Abraham deals with salvation through the son of, of the descendant of Abraham. The promise that God made to Abraham deals with Jesus. And so he's making this covenant for people to know Christ. He says this, verse 18, Beware, lest there be among you a man or a woman, a clan or a tribe, whose heart is turning away today from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of those nations. Beware, lest there be in you a root bearing poisonous and bitter fruit. And one, when he hears the words of this sworn covenant, blesses himself in his heart, saying, I'll be safe, even though I walk in the stubbornness of my own heart. This will lead to the sweeping away of the moist and the dry alike, and the Lord will not be willing to forgive him. So a couple of things. He says, be careful that there's no one among you who, when you see all these idols in this land that you're going into, that decides you're going to worship these idols. By the way, that's what they're going to do. They're going to start serving these idols. He says that you'll be swept away, the moist and the dry alike, and that you God will un be unwilling to forgive them. And listen to what he says here. This is, this is the person who's deceiving themselves in their own heart. They say, I'll be safe, even though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart. And this is an interesting kind of mindset that like, I can do whatever I want to do and I'll be safe. So I would encourage you to read Jeremiah 7, 1 through 14, uh, but go and check it out. We'll cover it one day when we get to Jeremiah, but go and do that. I have it in the, in the blog notes for the additional reading material. So go and read Jeremiah 7, 1 through 14, because what happens there, this is hundreds of years later, by the way, what happens there in Jeremiah God, through the prophet Jeremiah, says, will my people who are called by my name really come into my temple, commit all these abominable things, serve all these idols, engage in all this wickedness, and then come into my temple and say, we're the people of the Lord. We're the people of the Lord. So in other words, they're engaging in all the sin and debauchery they want to engage in. And then they come into the temple of the Lord. And because they're worshiping in the temple of the Lord, they're like, ah, oh, see, we're good. We can do whatever we want to do because look, we're coming into the temple of the Lord. And, and so that's a stubborn heart. That's a wicked heart that would say, I can behave however I want to behave because I've, I'm covenant people of God. I'm welcomed in to the temple of the Lord. And it's, it's not a picture that we find in the New Testament of those who are committed to Christ. And so this idea also of the Lord will not be willing to forgive is probably a difficult situation for us because we've been told that the Lord is always willing to forgive. But at least this place and over in Joshua 24, 19, we see that, uh, that that's not the case all the time. Verse 24 says, all the nations will say, why has the Lord? So uh, this is when the Israelites, the Hebrews reject God, turn away from God, serve idols, and he cast them out of the land. He says, all the nations will say, why has the Lord done this to the land? What caused the heat of his great anger? And the people will say, it is because they abandoned the covenant of the Lord, the God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went and served other gods and worshiped them, gods they had not known and whom he had not allotted to them. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against this land, bringing upon it the curses written in the book. We talked about that yesterday. And the Lord uprooted them from their land in anger and fury and great wrath and cast them into another land as they are this day. The secret things belong to the Lord, our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do 
all the words of the law. Don't read yourself into this text, all right? Don't read yourself into this text. Again, America is not the New Testament Israel, all right? So don't read yourself into this text. This is about the nation of Israel rejecting God and the judgment that's going to come on it. And then down in chapter 30, uh, it talks about when all the curses come upon you because you disobeyed God. It says, then you return to the Lord. And he says this. Um, and he says in verse 4, chapter 30, verse 4, If your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will take you. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land that your fathers possessed, that you may possess it, and he will make you more prosperous and more numerous than your fathers. And then the Lord your God will circumcise your heart. We talked about that a few days ago. The heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, or that you may live. So he says, when, when you inevitably reject me and you turn away from me, and then you realize that you've sinned against me, and you come back in repentance to the Lord, he goes, then God will change your heart and make you have a heart that wants to serve him. This is very similar, again, to what we see in Jeremiah, where he says, God will take your heart of stone and make it a heart of flesh. And he says, you won't need any more people to teach you the laws of God because God will write the laws. He'll write obedience on your heart. And so again, God is always concerned with the heart. Then come down to chapter 30, verse 11. And he says, this commandment that I'm commanding you today, the commandment to serve and honor the Lord, this commandment that I'm commanding you today is not too hard for you. And it's not far away. It is not in heaven that you should say who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it down to us that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that we should say who will go over to the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. See, I have set before you today life. Uh, and good, death, and evil, if you obey the commandment of the Lord your God that I command you today by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways, keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you will live. Now, keep this in mind. Where he says this, the word is near you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart so that you can do it. Paul's going to use that in Romans 10, 8 through 10, to talk about what it means to put faith in Christ. He's going to say, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him, from, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the mouth one confesses and is and believes, and with the heart one it, one believes and is saved, is justified. And he says, the word of God is not far from you. So he's talking. Paul takes this text. The word of God is not far from you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. He, the, the idea here is that it's not about the works that you do. It's about what you believe. It's about what you believe about Christ. And so Paul, in talking about this in Romans 10, he'll quote a passage from Joel as well, that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved, that God has set before us life and death. And it's about what we believe about Jesus. He goes on to say in verse 17, but if your heart turns away and you will not hear, but you are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you will perish. You will not live a long time in the land you're going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live. Loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, holding fast to him, for he is your life and the length of your days that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, again, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. Now look at this, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, for he, God, is your life in your length of days. Our life is measured by who God is, not by who we are. And our lives um, have to be, like he's saying this to the people on the verge, on the cusp of the promised land. It's like, look, you're about to go into this land. You're about to go in and you're going to deny me and you're going to turn away from me. But you need to remember that your life is not in the things that you have. Man's life does not consist in his possessions. Man's life consists in what he knows and believes about the person and the work of God. These commandments of God are near you. They're in your mouth. You just believe. You confess that Christ is Lord. And so don't, don't get bogged down in this Old Testament covenant, the old covenant, and say, oh, this is the covenant we're under. Remember that the old covenant is the earthly, tangible covenant that is pointing to the supernatural new covenant in Christ. And Christ is the one that we hold to. If you want to be ahead for tomorrow, I would encourage you to read Deuteronomy 31 and 32, and we will see you then. Thank you so much for journeying with us today at Simpler Bible through another section of scripture where we come to know and understand God a little bit better. Look, if you're brand new to Simpler Bible, we have all sorts of resources available for you. Go to our website, simplerbible.com, and there you can find these videos, you can find our podcast, you can find links to our social media, and you can even find a blog post with additional scriptures if you want to go into a little bit more study than we had time to cover in this podcast and video today. 
We hope that this tool will be exactly that for you, a tool. Not something that replaces your daily walk with God, but something that enhances your daily walk with God and helps you to know and enjoy Him more. Thank you so much for being part of this, and we'll see you again tomorrow.